Welcome everybody to our next um, seminar in the undergraduate seminar series. Today's uh, speaker is Professor Gordon Drake uh, from the University of Windsor's physics department. Professor Drake is a professor emeritus at the University of Windsor. He has a BSc degree from McGill University, an MSc degree from the University of Western Ontario, uh, and a PhD from York University. He then did a postdoc position at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, and then has been working at the University of Windsor since then. He has uh, numerous accolades and uh, awards to his name. He is um, a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, a fellow of the American Physical Society, a past editor of the um, high impact journal Physical Review A. He's a past chair of the APS division of the, the uh, Atomic Molecular and Optical Physics, the UPAP Commission um, C15, past president of the Canadian Association of Physicists. Um, he has 225 refereed research papers, and he's, he's one of the most highly cited uh, um, scientists for his high precision calculations for two and three electron item, atoms, including relativistics and quantum electrodynamic effects. He's received numerous prizes, including the Killiam Fellowship, the Canadian Association of Physicists Herzberg Medal, the Medal for Achievement in Physics, the Peter Kirby Medal for Outstanding Service to Canadian Physics, and the Windsor Alumni Teaching Award. So this is another thing that um, is very unique about uh, Dr. Drake. He is not only exemplary in research, but also in teaching. And uh, so in addition to his ac academic work in physics, he has served as the principal of Canterbury College, the Anglican college that's affiliated with the University of Windsor since 2008. So today he's going to tell us about new physics from atomic Coulomb explosions following nuclear beta decay. And thank you, Dr. Drake. Oh, well, thank you very much for your uh, kind introduction and uh, welcome to uh, all the uh, participants. Um, this. Uh, uh, my topic is indeed new physics from atomic Coulomb explosions. And I'm, I'll, so I'll talk about that and also some of the background material on nuclear beta decay. Um, this is a, uh, a collaborative uh, project. My uh, co-authors are two of my uh, uh, students, uh, Eva uh, Schulhoff, who's currently completing her PhD, Aaron Bondi, who's at the uh, beginning stages of his PhD, uh, my master's student, Cody McLeod, and I have uh, three undergraduate students who are all members of my research group. Uh, also, uh, the, on the experimental side, we collaborate with uh, uh, an experimental group at the University of Washington, uh, headed by Alejandro Garcia, and also Peter Mueller at the uh, Argonne National Laboratory. So this is where the, uh, this is a joint theoretical experimental project that I'm going to be uh, telling you about uh, and we provide the theoretical support and interpretation of the experiments being conducted at these uh, other uh, laboratories. <clears throat> and uh, there's an overarching motivation to this whole project that uh, I'd like to, uh, that you should be aware of, that high accuracy atomic physics measurements at low energy have the potential to complement or even extend what can be learned from high energy particle experiments past years, this has become a hot topic. Uh, and there's a great deal of interest within the uh, atomic physics community in pursuing this line of research of uh, complementing what can be learned uh, from high energy particle experiments, especially as it gets more and more expensive to extend uh, things like the LHC to ever higher energies. Uh, sometimes it's a, a lot cheaper to be able to do a, 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 a tabletop experiment uh, at low energy, but very high precision. Uh, some examples of this are uh, parity non-conservation, searches for uh, an elect electron electric dipole moment, tests of quantum electrodynamics, tests of Lorentz invariance and general relativity, searches for dark matter, also a great uh, interest in cosmology, and the, my current topic, evidence for new physics in beta decay. So this is part of a, a much broader uh, program that's uh, currently uh, of great interest in atomic physics. <clears throat> uh, so the outline for my talk will first uh, review the theory of beta decay and halo nuclei, since this 
may not be uh, familiar to our, our undergraduate students. Uh, and then I'll uh, briefly summarize the experimental method at the University of Washington, Washington to measure angular correlations. And it's these angular correlations that will be of, uh, of uh, central interest uh, to my talk. Uh, and then I'll point out discrepancies between Eva Schohoff's uh, theory uh, from uh, 2015 and, uh, and the uh, experimental charge state distributions following beta decay. So this will be the main ta uh, uh, aspect of the second part of my talk to account for this discrepancy. And uh, that's Aaron Bondi's current uh, uh, project is to improve uh, theory to calculate these charge state distributions comparisons with experiment, and finally, remaining improvements and problems to be solved. So I'll just continue on for it. So what uh, is beta decay? Well, the, the simplest example of beta decay uh, is provided just by a free neutron, uh, which uh, uh, by itself lives for about 15 minutes. Uh, and then it undergoes this process of beta decay in emitting a beta particle and an antineutrino. Um, this was first worked out by uh, uh, Fermi uh, in the early 1930s. <clears throat> and uh, at that time, he didn't know anything about, about um, uh, the uh, uh, W bosons or, or the uh, quark structure of the nucleus of, of the uh, neutron and proton. But this does, in fact, provide us with uh, important insight into the, uh, uh, how this works. So in the quark model, a, a neutron consists of an up and, uh, and two down quarks. An up quark has charged two thirds, each down quark charged minus a third, so they add up to zero. And you can think of this process of uh, beta decay as a, a down quark turning into an up quark, uh, and thereby the charge changes from, uh, from zero to one, because we now have two thirds minus a third plus two thirds, which is one. Uh, the uh, uh, vector boson, the W particle, uh, is emitted and lives for a very short time and then decays into the uh, electron and the antineutrino. Uh, there, uh, in addition, there are two possible final states for the uh, neutrino uh, and the uh, uh, electron. They get, just as two electrons can be coupled to either with spins uh, parallel to form a triplet or antiparallel to form a singlet. So also the neutrino and the, uh, the electron can be coupled to form either a, a singlet or spin zero, and that's the original Fermi case uh, where the coupled to form spin zero, or the uh, parallel case, uh, which is the Ga uh, gamoff teller uh, case worked out by George Gamoff and Ed Teller at, the, uh, at Columbia University during the 1930s. So actually this basic theory goes back a long way, far before people knew anything about the quark model uh, or the, uh, the, the existence of these uh, vector bosons. And so uh, you can work out the basic phenomenology uh, of this process without actually knowing anything about the, this, uh, this um, the deeper level of detail that uh, allows us to understand uh, at a deeper level uh, this uh, process of beta uh, decay. Uh, inside, uh, a nucleus, if a neutron is inside a nucleus, that's the next slide. In the case of, of helium, uh, helium has two stable isotopes, helium-3 and helium-4. Uh, the uh, the helium-4 uh, helium has, of course, two protons, two neutrons, uh, but there's also unstable isotopes, uh, helium-6 and, and helium-8. And helium-6 has two additional neutrons, uh, and uh, in the case of helium-4, they, they can't undergo beta decay because it's energetically not allowed. It is energetically allowed for helium-6. And in fact, it only lives for a, a little less than a second. Uh, so if you form helium-6, uh, it, it rapidly decays uh, to, uh, uh, by, the, by the, the same process of beta decay so that the, the, uh, the neutron uh, uh, turns into a proton with the exact, and it, it goes on almost as if the, it weren't in a nucleus. It's almost independent of the fact that it's uh, sitting in a nucleus. Uh, helium-8, and by the way, this is called a halo nucleus because the neutrons form like a, a halo around the uh, more tightly bound quarks. So There's like a neutron shell uh, around the, uh, the, uh, um, uh, 
electrons and protons uh, uh, inside the the uh, sorry uh, the protons and neutrons inside the alpha alpha particle core. Um, the uh, uh, this picture uh, in fact uh, comes from a paper uh, that was published in Reviews of Modern Physics uh, by my as my collaborators uh, and the original uh, purpose of this work was to measure the size of these uh, uh, these halo nuclei from the atomic isotope shift. And, uh, and so that, uh, that was the, uh, the original uh, goal of this. And in fact, the, uh, the, uh, if you take, uh, it's like the uh, Borromean rings, which, which if, you, if you remove any one of them, the other two fall apart. And so we have the same thing here. If you take away one of the neutrons, then the remaining neutron and the uh, are unbound. Um, and so it's the core, it's a, a detailed correlation among all three particles interacting with the, the uh, through the nuclear strong force that uh, that holds this together. So the original purpose of this work, uh, published in 2013, was to measure the size of these things. Uh, and in fact, I'm very proud of this picture because it appeared on the front. It was selected to be the the cover picture for this issue of reviews of modern physics. And so the objective there was to measure the size of the helium-6 uh, halo nucleus from the atomic isotope shift by combining our high precision theory of atomic structure with experiment. And, and this was the focus of our research for uh, up until on this topic, up until 2013. We've now entered the second phase to study the beta decay process itself. Uh, the main tool uh, are essentially exact solutions to the quantum mechanical three-body problem. And that, in fact, is the main uh, tool, the main workhorse that uh, provides, that allows us to provide uh, high-precision calculations um, for, uh, for these uh, 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 processes. So uh, the, now, so where, where is the evidence for uh, new physics, potential evidence? Well, the, the, I mentioned there were two kinds of uh, transitions, spin zero and uh, spin one for the final state. Uh, in the spin zero case, uh, it's, a, it's called a vector interaction. Uh, in the, uh, the spin one case, axial vector, because it's like an angular momentum. Axial mean, just means that it's, uh, it's uh, invariant under a mirror reflection, whereas a vector uh, reverses sign under mirror reflection. So those are the two basic kinds of interaction, but there are other possible kinds of interaction that could contribute a scalar and a tensor interaction. And these influence the uh, angular correlation between the electron and the uh, antineutrino. So you can see in the upper picture that the, uh, uh, they are, 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 are close together, whereas here they are, uh, for the gamma teller case, uh, far apart. So it's quite different angular correlations. And, they, uh, and this also uh, would uh, show up in, uh, in terms of the uh, energy distribution of the, uh, of the um, ion recoil, ion recoil momentum. Of the, the beta particle itself has a continuous distribution of energies, uh, as I think the medical physics students probably learned uh, in the uh, medical physics course that beta decay produces a continuous distribution of, uh, of uh, energies. And that's because it's, there are three outgoing particles. Uh, and so the, uh, the neutrino uh, carries away part of the energy. And the difficult part of the uh, experiment though is that the antineutrino cannot be observed. It escapes from the, the uh, apparatus in fact. Uh, neutrinos can pass right through the Earth undeflected. So in fact, they're very difficult things to observe. So the experimentalists have to deduce the, uh, the, uh, this angular correlation by overall conservation of energy and momentum. And so that, that's what makes this experiment uh, difficult is to be able to uh, deduce from conservation of momentum the uh, recoiling uh, uh, energy. Uh, recoil the, an the angular correlation. Uh, <clears throat> and, and so just in, in more detail, the, the uh, angular correlation factor is this, uh, the dot product of the, the, um, the electron momentum and the uh, new anti-neutrino momentum. And there's this, this angular correlation factor, the kind of, uh, it's a bit rather difficult to see uh, that uh, alpha 
is the angular correlation factor. And that varies from minus a third for uh, over on the diagram here for the, the, uh, uh, the uh, axial vector case, the, uh, the um, uh, gamma of Teller case to uh, plus, uh, plus one up in the uh, upper uh, right-hand corner. Uh, uh, in, in the case of, of, of the uh, helium-6, it's thought to be a pure gamma of Teller process, purely uh, axial vector. So any deviation um, from that, that's down in the uh, lower left-hand corner, uh, so any deviation from this angular correlation factor of minus a third would then be an indication of new physics beyond the standard model, and uh, perhaps uh, indication for uh, a uh, an indication for a new uh, particle. <clears throat> uh, just to look a bit at the history of this, uh, these experiments were first performed uh, in uh, 1963 in this uh, paper at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory uh, by Johnson and his uh, collaborators, uh, and they obtained a, a rather uh, good agreement with the expected angular correlation factor. You can see it here in the, uh, in the abstract that uh, alpha is minus 0 0.3343, which is very close to minus a third, uh, indicating uh, that, the, that this angular correlation is what was expected from theory. And, and this played an important role in establishing the standard model for the elementary particle interactions. Uh, and uh, uh, so it was, uh, play, uh, it was important in the history of the, uh, of the subject. Um, the current interest though is to improve the accuracy of this to see if, there's, if you do the experiment more accurately, will you see a deviation from being exactly minus a third? And so that would carry a signal for this to be uh, uh, an, uh, uh, evidence for some uh, new physics beyond the standard model. Um, our, our, our present, the present Washington collaboration uh, was first published in 2017, following our earlier theoretical paper at the uh, bottom of the slide. This is the, uh, Eva Schohoff's work uh, on um, uh, uh, studying the electron emission and recoil effects following beta decay uh, of, uh, of helium-6. And, uh, and there's a disagreement between theory and experiment that uh, is highlighted by these two papers. And so that, that's what I'm going to talk about next is, the, uh, is that this disagreement and uh, what can be done to uh, resolve it. So, the, uh, so the, remember that the helium-6 uh, undergoes uh, beta decay to form uh, lithium-6 plus the uh, beta particle and an antineutrino. Oh, by the way, I just mentioned in passing, the way that you make helium-6 uh, is by, uh, well, in fact, that's, that's shown here uh, in this uh, uh, diagram of the experiment. You make helium-6 by bombarding a, lit uh, a lithium-7 target with 18 MeV uh, um, uh, deuterons. Uh, and the deuterons knock some of the uh, uh, lithium, knock the, a proton out of some of the uh, lithium nuclei. Uh, so that, uh, if you knock out a proton, then uh, the uh, lithium, lithium seven turns into uh, helium six if you just knock out a proton. So that's the way that you make it. Uh, the, um, so the, the, if you, uh, use the atomic beam contains helium six, it enters the, uh, of course it lives for only an eighth of a uh, point eight of a second. Uh, and uh, so uh, here it is from inside the, uh, the apparatus. And I should give uh, credit to uh, Aaron for this, Beautiful sequence of slides. So here, use the helium-6 nucleus, and uh, so you wait for 0.8 of a second, and then what happens? It suddenly undergoes uh, beta decay, and uh, so the the lithium uh, turns uh, the helium-6 turns uh, into lithium-6. And so what we want to do is to, uh, uh, of course, it's exponential decay. Uh, on average, they live for 0.8 in a second, but any individual nucleus undergoes this transition essentially instantaneously. And that's the, the key point that, um, that, it, uh, that it doesn't take 0.8 in a second for this to happen. It happens essentially instantaneously, but on average, the lifetime is 0.8 in a second. Uh, so what, what happens here, here are the decay fragments. We have the 
beta particle going up toward the top, then adding neutrino to the left, and the recoiling heli uh, lithium-6 uh, nucleus going off to the left. And <clears throat> with the sudden change in, in the nuclear uh, uh, charge, this uh, it still has two atomic electrons. And, and, and so these now have to ad instantaneously adjust themselves to this change in uh, the nuclear uh, charge. And so some can be ejected. Uh, and so the, uh, they boil off uh, in this pr uh, process called either shake up if it forms an uh, excited uh, bound state or shake off. Uh, to, uh, and these are the second and third uh, processes shown here, uh, either to, to form lithium uh, two plus plus a free electron or lithium three plus plus two uh, additional uh, electrons. And so these are, these are the three possible final states that the lithium uh, ion can, uh, can end up in. Um, the uh, discrepancy between theory and experiment is the amount of lithium three plus that, that's formed. Now, why is this important? Remember I said that, that we want to deduce this angular, uh, angular cor correlation, the theta shown in this diagram. We want to deduce what that is from overall conservation of energy and momentum. Well, we can't do that unless we can account for the momentum of all the particles. So if there are additional electrons emitted, we have to include those in the overall balance of uh, uh, momentum. Otherwise, we might see a deviation and misinterpret it as a signal for new physics when it really is just ordinary physics uh, resulting from electrons boiling off after the uh, beta decay process. So the overall process is we have um, uh, beta decay, uh, and then uh, an instantaneous change in uh, nuclear charge, and then additional electrons boil off uh, to form lithium uh, double plus and, and three plus. Uh, and, so, uh, and so here's the, uh, this angular correlation factor, the uh, PE dot P nu that we want to, uh, we want to measure that, uh, that uh, <clears throat> correlation between the, the directions of emission and so we, uh, we, need to, we need complete knowledge about all the other decay fragments in order to deduce what happened to the, uh, to this, uh, uh, to the, uh, the anti-neutrino. From conservation of energy and momentum, what happens to the atomic electron? So that's the question that, that we want to address. <clears throat> and in, uh, in the experiment itself, uh, you, uh, the, uh, the uh, people at the University of Washington did a Monte Carlo simulation, and that's shown by this uh, picture, this uh, lower picture with the three triangles. Uh, these are the uh, time of flight. So as, as the the uh, the recoiling uh, nucleus uh, is uh, drawn with a, a strong uh, electric field, and so the the, the high, more highly charged ones move faster than the uh, less highly charged. And so you can see uh, in terms of the, there's this time of flight going across the bottom of the, uh, the diagram. The, um, so the, the triply uh, charged ions arrive first, then the doubly charged, and then the singly charged. That's what's expected uh, ex uh, experimentally, uh, theoretically from the uh, Monte Carlo simulation. What's actually observed is that the triple plus is almost completely absent. So it's not just a, a, a small effect. The, Lithium three plus is just not there, and uh, so that's what uh, that's uh, one of the uh, that's the key thing that we want to explain. <clears throat> and uh, so, just to give you an idea of uh, the energy level spectrum, what we're we're talking about uh, in this uh, diagram to the right, you see the bound states uh, leading up to the first ionization limit uh, at minus four point five uh, in atomic units. Now, why 4.5? Those of you who remember your uh, quantum mechanics and the energy levels for a helium atom, for a hydrogen atom, the remember the, the energy is minus uh, z squared over uh, two uh, n squared, or if n is if for the ground state, it's just uh, it's just one, so it's uh, minus nine over two, which is minus 4.5. So that's the energy of a lithium double plus, which is now just a one electron system because one electron has been removed. 
So that so below the uh, the all the bound states of lithium plus lie below the first ionization limit uh, at minus four point five. Above that, we have lithium double plus plus one free electron. Uh, if we go further up to zero on the scale, then that is the threshold for the formation of lithium triple plus plus two free electrons. Uh, and so in this double crosshatch region at the top, we have uh, uh, both, both cases are possible. Um, up to this point, it's uniquely defined uh, in terms of energy. Uh, lithium double plus plus one electron is the only thing that can exist uh, in this intermediate range between zero and minus 4.5. Uh, above that, both can exist, can coexist, both lithium double plus and lithium triple plus. Now, in our earlier calculations, we divided this up according to energy bin, and we took everything in, in the uh, middle bin to be uh, lithium double plus, the double uh, charge state, and everything in the upper bin to be lithium triple plus. And so this is at least part of the source of this discrepancy uh, uh, between theory and experiment is that the energy bin contains both species. Uh, and so, there, uh, and so the, it could be misleading us into thinking that there's uh, more lithium triple plus than it really is, because it's really just lithium double plus plus uh, two electron, plus one electron. So the main objective is to account for the lack of lithium triple plus in the shake-off spectrum. That's what we call this process of the electrons boiling off uh, after the Coulomb explosion. <clears throat> and uh, so uh, in, in, in order to formulate this uh, theoretically, uh, the, the uh, approximation that's been used in all past work that we continue to use uh, is the sudden approximation where we regard the change from uh, a charge of two to three as being instantaneous. Uh, and that allows us then to expand the initial state, in, uh, initial, that's the, the helium state, in, in terms of a complete set of final states, the final states being the, uh, the states of, of lithium plus. So the initial state is helium six, uh, either in the ground state or uh, 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 the experiment was actually done with the helium in the metastable triplet state, the one S, two S uh, triplet S state. So these are three possible choices for the initial state. The final state is, uh, is one of the possible lithium plus or, or double plus or triple plus, a complete set of possible final states. The E to the IKR is the, is the unitary transformation that takes us to the moving frame of reference that moves along with the recoiling uh, lithium, uh, lithium six. So remember that, the, uh, that we're looking at, we want the, the recoil is a, a, a key part of this whole uh, problem to find, uh, to. Uh, take that to, uh, we need to understand that recall in order to deduce where, uh, where the uh, unobserved neutrino went. Uh, so this is the uh, final state. The uh, method of calculation, I, I don't have time to go into any uh, detail on this, but the way that I, I did say that we have essentially exact solutions to the quantum mechanical three-body problem. So how do, how do we do that and construct wave functions that contain explicitly powers of the, uh, uh, of the uh, coordinates of the two electrons. So here we have, here we have the, the nucleus at the origin and uh, the two electrons uh, orbiting about the nucleus. R1 and R2 are the position vectors for the two electrons and R12 is the separation between them. And the wave function is an explicitly correlated product of all three of those uh, coordinates. And you can, prove that this is uh, a complete basis set. So it is, it's, not, it's not a separable wave function. So it's not like a Hartree-Fock or simple product type wave functions. It's an explicitly correlated wave function. And you can prove that this is a, uh, a complete, forms a complete basis set. And what you do is you include all combinations of the powers, uh, i, j, k, those are the powers of R1, R2, and R12. Uh, include all combinations such that i plus j plus k is less than or equal to an integer, and then you progressively increase that integer, one, two, three, uh, all the way up to uh, 10, 20, as, large as, uh, as far as you are able to go with your computer uh, resources. 
and then and, and this is called a peckerous shell of states. And then you study the convergence as that uh, as this quantity omega gets bigger and bigger, the answer should converge to a, a definite a definite number. And, uh, and so by studying that convergence, you can then assign an uncertainty to the final result. So that's the the basic this is the basic workhorse of all of our calculations are these explicitly correlated two electron wave functions. Uh, you can also do this for three electrons, but in fact, that's the limit of technology. Nobody has done an explicitly correlated four electron calculation. So that so the, the, the limit of, of, of what we can uh, what can be done uh, is, uh, is three electrons. And these are, uh, as, uh, you can get energies accurate to parts in 10 to the 20. Uh, Non-relativistic energies, of course, you have to add then relativistic and quantum electric dynamic corrections, but um, this at least provides a firm foundation on which to build those higher order corrections. And it's something unique that you can do for the helium and lithium cases that cannot be extended, at least not yet, to heavier uh, atoms. So that's an important project for the future. So the, any, so the point is that, that that is how we construct these uh, wave functions. Uh, and I just wanted to point out uh, what happens as you progressively increase the size of the basis set. So going across the bottom n is the number of terms in, in this uh, basis set that is combinations of powers of i, j, k. How many? So if you just have just uh, say zero, 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 that's a one term. Uh, if you have uh, two terms, would be uh, let's say a zero, zero, one, zero, zero, zero plus zero, zero, one, and so on. If you include more and more terms. So if you just, if, and if you diagonalize the Hamiltonian in that basis set, then initially on the left, you just have a single eigenvalue. If you have two, you get two eigenvalues, three, three eigenvalues, and so on, four, five. And the, uh, the lesson that uh, should be learned from this diagram is that uh, it's, not, it's not just the ground state that perform, uh, forms an upper bound to the exact ground state energy. So the E1, E2, E3, these are the exact eigenvalues. And, uh, and the hilarist Menheim mcdonald theorem says that each one of these, all the excited ones, converge from above to the uh, exact energies as the basis set is progressively enlarged. So moving from left to right across the diagram uh, corresponds to increasing the size of the basis set. Uh, but the, the second uh, important uh, uh, aspect of this diagram is that the, uh, you can optimize one state, but all the rest form a set of pseudo states that represent, uh, provide a discrete representation of the infinity of bound states plus the continuum. So instead of summing over an infinity of bound states and integrating over the continuum, you can just do a single sum over this uh, discrete set of pseudo states. And so this is a tremendously powerful computational technique that enables you to, uh, to perform these sums over intermediate states. Uh, so the prescription then is uh, to expand the initial state in terms of this complete set. Um, and uh, the transition probability then, uh, according to Born's rule, is that it's just the, the matrix element. If you expand the final initial state in terms of the complete set of final states, then the, the squares of the expansion coefficients are the transition probabilities. And so that's where this PIF comes from. Uh, these are the uh, transition probabilities. The K here, this is the recoil momentum of the, uh, of the nucleus. And, and so the, the, if you do a power series expansion, the leading term just gives the A. Uh, the next non-vanishing term is a K squared term. And so this is important for the understand the recoil, but under, to understand the uh, charge state distribution, our main focus will just be on this leading A term. And, and, and that's in fact uh, much larger than the uh, recoil term. So we'll focus on the A term. There are ways of, of checking that, the, uh, uh, that our, our results make sense. First, the completeness of the wave functions uh, implies uh, prob uh, probability closure, which means that if you sum all the probabilities, it must, they must add up to one, to unity. If you, Add all the all uh, sum over all the possible final states, you must get unity. Uh, and we also found a second sum rule, uh, an, a generalization of the Thomas Reika Kuhn oscillator strength sum rule, 
Uh, you may not have encountered this before, but it's a, a very interesting result that if you know what the oscillator strength is, uh, uh, the oscillator strength is basically the energy difference times the square of the dipole uh, matrix element. And normally you calculate this between uh, the uh, uh, between states of the same atom. But now we're uh, going from helium to lithium plus. So it's like a dipole transition going from helium to lithium plus. And so normally the oscillator strength sum just to the number of electrons. And that's why it's called an oscillator strength. It's like the strength, it's like the amount of a classical oscillator per electron. And so if you sum over all of them, you should just get the number of electrons. And in this case, n is two. Uh, but we, since the uh, Coulomb potential changes in going from helium to lithium plus, there's an additional term in the oscillator strength. Some raw, and that's the second term here. So it, uh, it, it contributes, and here's the, the one over R1 plus one over R2. That's the change in the Coulomb potential experienced by the two electrons times the square of the dipole matrix, uh, dipole operator. Uh, and uh, so this gives um, uh, the, uh, the, the, if you actually sum over uh, all the final states, you get minus 1.973, but you can then compare that with the uh, expected sum, which is minus two, minus this additional piece. Uh, and that, in fact, changes the sum from plus two to minus 1.973403. And the key thing here is that the two agree to within the accuracy. So we, we have some very powerful ways of checking that we do, in fact, uh, properly take into account all of the proper all possible final states of lithium uh, 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 of the uh, lithium plus. So uh, here, here are the uh, results that uh, uh, came from uh, uh, Eva's earlier work from the 2015 paper uh, for li uh, lithium plus person at the top uh, or the case where we start from the ground state of helium. Uh, and the, the second column are, is uh, uh, Eva's theory. The third column, uh, re reference two, is, the, is uh, uh, another calculation that was done uh, by uh, uh, Wouters and, and Weich uh, in 1996. And on the third, uh, last, last column are the, the uh, experimental values. These are percentages that end up in each of these charge states, lithium plus, double plus, and triple plus. And on the whole, there's a pretty good agreement but the, uh, the case of lithium three plus, you can see here uh, the uh, huge disagreement. Uh, theory gives 1.2% in column one, uh, a bit better in 0.32, because in that case, they partially took into account the partition uh, into uh, a different, uh, in the overlapping region of the continuum, but they're both huge compared to the observed value of 0 0.018 plus or minus one five. So it's almost consistent with zero. Um, if we start from, uh, that was the, uh, the older 1963 experiment, the more recent one at University of Washington for the, uh, the 1S, 2S, triplet S case, uh, they, couldn't, they couldn't see the lithium triple the three plus at all. It just was totally absent. Uh, whereas the uh, EVA's theoretical value was 1.86%. So again, we see a huge disagreement between theory and experiment. And so what we want to do in, uh, in Aaron's work is to resolve the single plus double ionization part of the continuum into its component parts, to, to tease apart these two uh, contributions. Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, so, the, so this is, uh, so we want to take our, uh, the, uh, the, the single plus double ionization part at the top and partition it into its uh, two separate components uh, so that we can examine each one separately. <clears throat> and uh, so the way that's done is to form uh, first uh, uh, one electron wave functions that in fact match the outgoing boundary conditions. So we can, and then we can distinguish one state from another by whether or not they, they both electrons have positive energy. In a one electron model, we can say if, if, one's, if, if one's bound and the other's continuum, then uh, uh, you can see that one, one electron has a bound state energy and the other continuum, whereas if they're both in continuum states, they both, both electrons have positive energy. So if, if, if they're both positive, we know that that's a doubly outgoing uh, uh, state. 
uh, and if it, uh, otherwise it's, uh, uh, it belongs to the single ionization continuum. Uh, and uh, let me just, I just want to go back and make one other point. First, in the, um, if you're right at threshold, there's uh, right at this, uh, right at the uh, dividing line between the, um, the uh, double plus and triple plus, when we just come to the point where the two electrons are coming out, they must come out exactly correlated. They must exactly share the energy. Uh, if one gets a little bit ahead, uh, if, if, if one lags behind, the other one will take off with all the energy and we have single ionization. So, so the, the probability of double ionization is suppressed right at threshold because the two electrons must be exactly and precisely correlated as they uh, leave the nucleus. Uh, uh, and so that, and so the the uh, cross section for uh, double ionization rises from zero. This is a phase space argument. There's just no phase space available for both electrons to uh, escape simultaneously when you're right at threshold. Uh, and so what we want to do is to, uh, and so we can then uh, by monitoring the, the energies of the one electron states, we can. Uh, form a provably complete product states of one electron, uh, uh, these pseudo states are also called Sturmian functions, it means the same thing. Sturmian functions are the same as the pseudo states that I showed a, a few slides ago. And, and, and take the electron electron interaction with a small perturbation. And so we form projection operators uh, with these product states to resolve the overlapping single and double continuum. So here, uh, here they are at the bottom of the side, the P plus plus means both electrons have positive energy. The other possibilities would be a P, uh, would be a, a, a P plus minus, P minus plus, and minus minus. So the minus minus, those are the bound states of lithium plus. The minus pluses are the singly ionized states, and the plus plus are the doubly ionized. So this is a, uh, a this uh, forms a projection operator. If you studied projection operators in quantum mechanics, this is just an example of a projection operator that we act on the, uh, the action on the wave function, we are now projecting out the doubly, uh, double ionizing uh, continuum. And so that re then resolves the crosshatch uh, uh, states on the left into a, a single, just the, the pure double ionization. And so let's look at the uh, results. Um, if we take the ground state, remember before it was 1.2% uh, for probability of lithium pl uh, plus, that's the double pl uh, single plus double, double. And now uh, the, uh, Aaron's new results uh, are shown in this table. It's a convergence table. We look down the, and so going across the top are the number of, uh, of these uh, uh, Hilarus wave functions, the 8, 10, 12, that's the number of terms uh, in the Hilarus uh, basis set. Uh, and then going down the uh, going down the uh, the co first column is the uh, number of uh, corresponding terms in these in the projection operators, uh, and so you can see that it's converging to something considerably smaller than 1.2. It's around uh, 0.33. The bottom the bottom left 0 0.41. So this is 0.41 percent as compared to 1.2. So we've at least gone part way to accounting for the discrepancy just by projecting out. The, uh, the double ionization continuum. Um, the, the top line are the zero order terms. The, the second row are the uh, are perturbation corrections due to the electron-electron interaction. So that, that's actually quite small. Uh, now, if we take the, uh, the other case, the uh, 1s, 2s, triplet s case corresponding to the Washington experiment before we had 1.86%, and now that's dropped down to around 0.6%, about a factor of three smaller that, that we've gained. Uh, so we're certainly uh, going in the right direction in projecting out the, the um, double ionization continuum, but uh, and this is the, uh, so some way to go. This is the corresponding 1s to a single s state. Uh, if you remember from uh, your transition probabilities, uh, these states are metastable because there's no electric dipole transition connecting them to the ground state. So the 1s, 2s, triplet s, and the 1s, 2s, singlet s are both metastable states of helium. Uh, they, uh, the, 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 uh, the singlet state lives for uh, about um, 
uh, a fiftieth of a second, uh, where and the triplet state lives for about ten thousand seconds. It's an incredibly long-lived uh, metastable state. Okay, so the, and so here's our uh, final uh, summary of the results uh, for uh, different initial initial states on the left-hand column. Uh, one s the ground state, one s squared singlet s, and the two metastable states, uh, the one s two s triplet s and singlet s. And for Meva's 2015 theory, one, uh, in percents, 1.2 and 1.86 percent. <clears throat> and uh, in our, our present work, uh, this has now been reduced to 0.32 and 0.51 percent, uh, but still much bigger than the experimental. Uh, uh, numbers and so there's still a, a, a an important problem here to be resolved. Uh, so we've made some progress, but there's still more work to do. So what else might it be? Uh, certainly at this level, it's not new physics. Uh, this is just uh, straight atomic physics. So, but what are the things that? What are the assumptions? What are the approximations we've made? Well, first we've assumed this sudden transition. Whereas, in fact, the, uh, the beta particle, when it's emitted, you can think of it as an expanding sphere of charge. Of course, you detect it in going in some particular direction, but that particular direction is an equal probability of being in any direction. And that's what you mean by an S state. It's spherically symmetric. So you detect it going in a particular direction, but, that, but the number detected is the same in all directions. So you can think. And so it, it's not, but it's not, it doesn't, this sphere doesn't expand instantaneously, it's expanding with the velocity of light. And so that time, that introduces a time dependence to this process that hasn't been taken into account. Uh, in addition, the beta particle itself uh, it, it is in fact uh, indistinguishable from the atomic electrons. And so there are exchange effects between the beta particle. Uh, and so, uh, and the atomic electrons. And so a more detailed model of the beta particle uh, might also play a role in uh, resolving this uh, discrepancy. Um, so that's the, that will be the next uh, step uh, uh, in this is to is first to do a, a, a full time dependent uh, calculation, taking into account the finite speed of uh, expansion of this uh, uh, spherical shell of charge corresponding to the beta particle as it's uh, emitted. And so I see we're just about up to our time limit. So I'll stop there and uh, ask if there are uh, any questions. Uh, you can also address questions uh, to my uh, email, drake at uwindsor.ca. You might also be interested in looking at our web pages, all kinds of online notes. Uh, and uh, 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 lecture notes and uh, other notes on uh, how to use my, my programs, uh, how to gen how to calculate these uh, very high accuracy uh, wave functions for for the the three uh, body uh, quantum mechanical problem. Um, also, I have uh, room. I'm still here. I'm Professor Emeritus. Uh, I'm still active in research and still interested in uh, new graduate students. If, you're uh, interested in participating in these uh, these projects, uh, which uh, involve not, not just our work here, but international collaborations with uh, uh, people in uh, Triumph, uh, at the Argonne National Laboratory in Chicago, uh, and GSI in Germany. These are all parts of our uh, collaboration. So I'll stop there and uh, invite questions. Ah, yes, Steve. I see Steve here. That that's me. That's me clapping my hands. Professor oh, Rao oh, taught me how to. <laughs> well, I was I was in my talk. I was saying I don't think if we know how to do uh, virtual clapping yet. And just said, oh yeah, there's a little hand clapping icon. So now we can instead of right. clap. So that was just me clapping, which I just learned oh, two okay. weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> see, I don't know how many. I can't tell from my screen how many participants we have. Oh, uh, there's about uh, eight of us online. One, two, three, eight. I can only see four. Seven, eight, something like that. Yep. Uh, it says participants twelve actually at the bottom. Oh, twelve. Oh, okay. that, that's what that's what it says. So yeah. Do we actually have a record of the of the names? Uh, yeah, they're 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 all on, they're all on there. So yeah. Okay. I guess I, well, I can I can escape 
when you do you can escape out and see yeah, those. Okay, so there's nothing in and show and then, then show things. There's there's nothing yeah. in the chat. There's nothing in the chat. So I'll say uh, thank you very much, uh, doc, Dr. Drake, for for that. Uh, if nothing else, I can say thank you for confirming a lot of the things I've been teaching in the fourth year quantum mechanics class. And I actually took uh, right near the end. I took a screenshot that I will be showing to my class if I have time on the spectroscopic notation and the question that confused all of them. And I can say, see, this is where this comes up, and this is how uh -huh. it's used. And they will be very glad to actually perhaps see an example of that. So that was ah, fantastic. Yeah, is that for the atomic states or the or the, the nuclear uh, the atomic? States? It was for the for the atomic states. At oh the yeah, end, the, just... the, 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 the uh, one s two s triplet s and single s. Correct. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I, we... those, yeah. That's that's very. I mean, the, the experiment was done. The the reason for doing the experiment with these metastable states is because they have large polarized abilities, and you can trap them. This is mm -hmm. a mock trap. And uh, if they're they're if they're not uh, helium six is not charged, uh, and so you have to have some way of trapping it. And you trap it because it's through its polarizability. The ground state, the polarizability is just too small. It's too right. it's too tightly bound. Right. But the the metastable state is uh, is highly polarizable, and so you can trap it in a mock trap. I, I did have one question. Maybe I'll start people off with uh, before they start thinking. Back on uh, around about page eight of your talk, you were kind of talking about your Hilleris solutions to the three body problem. Excuse me. Right. Um, and I was wondering, uh, just because uh, I've heard some talks from your group before on the Hilleris thing, but is there, when you, you're saying these are almost exact solutions, is there a degradation of that uh, variational method? Uh, when you start to get to extended sizes of the nucleus, meaning, so I, I've seen your group do like, uh, so like H minus, right? So yeah. that's a three body system. But what about if you did, so now you're talking lithium plus, what if you went to sodium plus, potassium plus, it's, the, it's all three, three body, but now the nucleus is getting much more extended, right? You've got this much more extended yeah. finite size of the nucleus. Does yeah, that change anything? Not, yeah, it's still on an atomic scale. It's still, it's still a small perturbation. Okay. And so you just include it by perturbation theory. Okay. There. We, okay. Yep. Yeah, and mean, that's so easily accounted for then. Yeah. 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 I mean, even even uh, I mean, uh, we also we can do two electron uranium, and even even then, uh, the nucleus is still only a few fermions in size. Sure. Sure. A few femtometers, mm -hmm. which, is, which is still tiny compared to the. Of course, well, of course, the um, I mean, the atomic uh, unit of distance scales uh, as one over the nuclear charge. And so uh, an atomic unit becomes one over 92 instead of one for, for hydrogen. But even so, uh, it, it's, still, it's still small. But in the muonic case, that's, that's more interesting because, ah. then, because the muon, its uh, Bohr radius scales uh, as, as um, uh, I, uh, yeah, one, uh, it becomes smaller. So yeah, so it scales as one over the mass. The, the Bohr radius is h bar squared over m e squared, right? h bar squared over m e squared. And so, uh, and if the mass is 205 times bigger, then the Bohr radius is in fact, uh, the muon is just skimming the surface of the nucleus. Right, so, wow. So, so then it's a, it's a big effect. Cool, okay, yeah. right. Okay, excellent. Thank you. I guess I was thinking of the atomic version, so the answer is, is no. But I, I that that's an interesting uh, variation of the question, which I was not thinking of. So yeah, that's what I try to teach my students: is, is how how do things scale with, sure. the, with the charges and masses, and uh, and so uh, you know the, the atomic unit of distance scales in proportion to both to uh, z and uh, both one over z and uh, one over the mass. Okay. All right. Fantastic. So that gives uh, a lot of insight into, and of course, the energies go way up, and the and the speed goes way up. So the more massive, the closer yeah. and the faster. Does anyone else have any uh, questions for Dr. Drake? I've asked my mm -hmm. question, so I please invite. Uh, mm -hmm. You might as well just unmute yourself and ask it if you don't want to type it. I think he, Dr. Drake can hear you, so yeah, please yeah, go, go, go ahead. ahead. I think there's lots of good, uh, I mean, for the people who are who are listening, and if you're listening to this on uh, YouTube, because we will be posting this later, so thank you everybody for joining us if you're on, on YouTube. It just points out this um, 
you know, the long uh, history of uh, high precision calculations and the advances they can make in nuclear physics and standard model physics uh, as well. So I, I really like, I appreciated very much that introduction you gave at the beginning, Dr. Drake, that uh, yeah. I think when people think standard model particle physics, it's always the atom smashers and the CERN labs and things like yes. that. And these these precision, the, the way precision measurements have gone in the last two or three decades is, you know, not saying that there's no need for the big experiments, but yeah. there's lots of fertile ground for yeah. these smaller might, tabletop experiments. Yeah. I might mention that Eric Hessels at York University has a very interesting proposal to do a, a high precision measurement of uh, looking for the, the uh, electron electric dipole moment in a, uh, a, a, a heteronuclear molecule. And inside a molecule, you have huge electric fields. And, uh, and so you can observe uh, an electron in, in the uh, molecular field and then, and then do uh, uh, reversals, uh, looking for a signal for the, uh, the electron having a, a, a dipole moment, which would, which would be, uh, take us right outside of the standard model because electrons are supposed to be structureless point-like particles. A direct particle has, uh, has, has no structure. One of the great mysteries of physics, we talked about uh, uh, muons, uh, which is also a direct particle, supposed to be point-like uh, charged particle. So how does one point-like uh, particle of mass 205 turn into an electron when they're both structures? So what's, what's going on? Nobody knows. <laughs> So questions, Any anyone else? Some of these people are in Dr. Drake's group who are here, so they obviously know all these things. They don't wanna, they don't wanna chime up, but I, I, I do note that uh, uh, we should comment for the people um, who are watching this uh, perhaps later or online that uh, Aaron Bondi looks like he's logged in. So I, Dr. Drake, you gave lots of very nice, uh, um, a credit to, uh, to Aaron for some of that really nice work that he's reporting here. Mm -hmm. yes, um, so Aaron, excellent, excellent work. So I'm sure we're all very appreciative of, of that. So, um, oh, there's, there's a theory, which uh, then, sorry, there's a question here, Gordon. Uh, the chat says, uh, so, oh, that's, it's a great question. So it's a deep question. So what, mm -hmm. I, what kinds of techniques are involved in determining the scaling laws you mentioned? Oh, um, well, the, uh, what techniques, uh, well, I mean, the, just the, the form, I mean, if you the form, it's the form of the formulas, yeah, just look right. at the, what, right. what, what is, what, it's a very simple technique. I mean, it, it's just, it's as easy as falling off a log yes. uh, because the formula for the Bohr radius is E squared over yeah. uh, M, uh, H bar squared over M E right. squared. And, and M, M could be the electron mass, it could be the muon mass, it could be, a proton mass. Uh, you could have two protons orbiting each other, and and again, you would get uh, the, the scale. The time that this sets the scale for the problem, and similarly with nuclear charge, uh, the uh, if you just look at the uh, at the, the wave functions for a hydrogen atom, the the, the dimensionless variable involved. I mean, you can scale out the nuclear charge. So I, I think I, I think uh, that would actually make an interesting undergraduate colloquium as well, Dr. Drake. I, I understand the question mm -hmm. that uh, this this person is asking there. Uh, uh, yeah. So just the, the answer, like what Dr. Drake is saying, is we don't. He's not talking about measuring what the scaling laws are. He's saying when you have the equation, you know what the scaling laws are. But I, I can just vouch that when I introduce this idea in a kind of side way to undergraduates. Um, they're, they're very, very used to memorizing like equations, right? It's yeah. one over four pi epsilon naught E squared over R squared or something like that. And right. I keep telling them, but if you go to any theory talks, the first thing a theorist, theorist does is goes to dimensionless quantities <laughs> by going to the appropriate scale because it's so much, but they're really not used to thinking that way because they're kind of locked into this equation and just what you said, but not thinking about the scales yeah. and how yeah, does it change if you go to a muon mass and it's, we should talk about that more actually because you do it as part of your work all the time yeah. but in undergraduate physics i don't think they think about that scaling a lot yeah it's a very important thing for uh, students to learn and it took me oh, a long yeah. time to really appreciate yes. the power uh, of this and uh, and just by chance uh, today is uh, published in nature physics 
uh, a little invited uh, uh, tutorial that uh, I wrote on exactly this point on Hartree atomic units. And uh, so yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll distribute that. And uh, I think it, okay. it would be a good thing for uh, uh, just to circulate around the department. Right, right. So oh, Mohammed saying, I see, I was assuming these laws are experimentally determined. No, that's an excellent, that was an excellent question. Thank you very much for asking it because it, it really allows us to kind of uh, expand on what exactly, uh, what exactly he meant, uh, he, he meant by that. So um, yeah. So, but but fantastic question. Thank you very, very much for asking it. Because it's it, as Dr. Drake said, it's so important. Just thinking about scaling laws and thinking about scaling things is, as, as Dr. Drake said, it, it takes a while to do it. And if you if you don't do it, again, we just we don't assign so much homework where that's the kind of thing they have to do. It's all right. you know a little bit more plug and chug. And yeah. um, what you're talking about is another higher level of of of, of appreciating what the equations are telling you. I mm -hmm. guess. Yeah. So, I would encourage everybody to contact Dr. Drake and his group and learn more about thinking this way, which is so powerful. Yeah, and it, it shows the essential unity of physics that everything's tied together. You can't change one thing without changing everything. Yep. Okay, uh, last chance for questions. It's after five o'clock here. Yeah, just about supper time. Yep, it is supper time. So, um, okay, I think, uh, Dr. Rangan can probably turn off the recording at uh, some point, but with, she'll get to that in a second. So with that, uh, everybody, let us thank Dr. Drake one more time for that very illuminating talk on atomic physics and nuclear physics and particle physics. And that was uh, neutrino physics and uh, even got some Feynman diagrams in there, which was really great. So let's thank him one more time, everybody. So there's some, uh, yes, some, some hands coming in there. So, um, so. Yeah, it's a thank pleasure, you. pleasure talking and uh, see you next time. Yes, thank you so much. All right, and thanks everybody. So, uh, and as always, uh, we'll, this recording will stop in a, in a bit. I'll